There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Well, welcome to uh, another Word in your attic where we're joined by the excellent David Gedge. David, how nice to see you. How and indeed where are you? I'm very well, thank you, Mark. I'm in Brighton. This is where I live now. Which is where you posted some clips the other day of you and two other members of the wedding present, present uh, launching, I think busking, weren't you? And launching your yeah. 24 Songs project. Yeah, we've got this kind of project that's starting next year. We're doing a a seven-inch single every month for the whole year. We did it before, actually. In you 1990. did it in 1992. I remember the hit yeah. parade. It's kind of like a, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, it was it was basically because of that. You know, the 30th anniversary was coming the next year, and I was thinking, shall we do something to commemorate it in some way, or you know, celebrate it? I didn't want to do hit parade again, so it's kind of like a similar project with a kind of a nod to it, really. So, yeah, we but launched it's the same the, thing as that. You're doing you. So it's 24 yeah. songs coming out as an A and B side effectively of a single one yeah. a month. So 24 songs in a year. Is that right? Yeah, purely purely seven inch singles and uh, matching. And how, do you, how do you approach writing those? Because you're writing, I think, with, with John Stewart, aren't you, the, the guitarist? Is that yeah, right? yeah. Um, so is that a kind of Lennon McCartney thing where you say, right, we're going to meet on Thursday and we're going to write two songs. We're not going to sit around and wait for the, the muse to visit. No, I, th <laughs> I, think, I think these days, because we're, we're all so busy, because John's a teacher, he's, he's a lecturer, actually, and I've got loads of little projects on, on the boil. So, so what tends to happen these days is, because we've all got laptops with, with, you know, recording software on them, he'll do a little riff at home and send it to me, and then, you know, I'll, or, you know Melanie, the bass player, will, will do something and she'll send it to me, and then we'll kind of combine it as a little demo, and then we'll go into a rehearsal room and kind of arrange it, really. Uh, and then I'll do the lyrics later because, you know, sorry. Actually, that was very old fashioned of me to think that you actually had to physically get together. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think, I, I suppose when we first started, that's how we did it to a certain extent. But uh, it's it's not, you know, I'm not a, a much of a kind of, you know, like a jammer. You know, I'm not one of those kind of musicians. Hey, man, <laughs> crack up the amp and let's see what, you know, you know, I'm not one of those really. So it's it's always been more of a, you know, Kind of, kind of doing stuff at home and then bringing it to a rehearsal room and then you know everybody says no that's rubbish and going away and coming up with something else so yeah it's, it's just the way we've done it really i suppose how many have you written so far of the 24 songs i think there's about a third which are completely finished recorded mixed and currently in because that's the problem you know when we did it in 1992 we had the kind of might of RCA's manufacturing machine. So if we wanted to press up 15,000 singles, they said, yeah, when do you want them by next week? You know? Yeah, no, no. not anymore. No. Yeah. It's, it's like seven months or something. <laughs> so, so we've had to, I mean, it's a bit of a shame in a way because we've had to pay a bit of a premium. We had to use a, a more expensive pressing plant, shall we say, who could guarantee us, you know, the, you know, the delivery of the, of the things every month. So, so they that, are physical singles, aren't they? Yeah, totally physical singles. No download codes or anything. It's just, it's, it, it is literally like it was in 1992. And I quite like that, really. Uh, so to answer your question, we, yeah, a third of them are now in production. So they'll be coming out of like, you know, the first few months of next year. There's a third that we're currently, I was in the studio yesterday, actually, recording some vocals. So we're working on another third. And then there's about a third left that, that needs to be kind of, you know, finished, basically. So it's a bit of a deadline, really. Well, we, we'd like to dig through some of your, your old records, if, if you can. And the traditional way that we start this conversation is by asking people if they can remember what the record playing equipment was in the house where they grew up. So can you, actually, where did you grow up? Was it, was it Middleton? Leeds, was it were you in Leeds? No, middle, well, I, was, I was born in Leeds and then my parents moved to Manchester when I was about three. So I grew yeah. up in various parts of Manchester, but yeah, yeah, mainly... Middleton in, in North Manchester. That was right. So, can you remember what the record playing equipment equipment was? Yeah, it was just a, it, was, it was the classic kind of seventies home <laughs> hi fi. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I'm not, I don't think it had a cassette by, at that stage. So, I guess it was just a record player and uh, and a tuner with, with a you know for the, for the radio in it. And they used to yeah, they used to be on it all the time really. What did you What did your parents do? My my dad was 
weird my dad did loads of things he was trained as a butcher actually uh i think when he was 18 his mum you know or, or not even that probably 16 because he you know he didn't do higher education or anything so she just yanked him off to a, a butcher's and said okay you're going to be a butcher <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Yes, we, that's what he became. Here's some chops. Here's some chops. <laughs> Come on with some sausage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would have been bacon yeah. tomorrow. And, yeah. We were never short of meat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But then over the, he's done a lot of, you know, he was a bus driver for a while. He was a milkman for a while. You know, he, he's done a lot of those kind of service industries. Oh, it's pr- proper jobs, those, haven't they? Yeah, they are. Proper jobs. Very disappointing. Genuinely right? useful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And my well, role was uh, like a clerk or a secretary or sort of stuff. So uh, yeah. Were they music fans or were they record collectors? Did yeah. What sort of records did they have? They had loads of seven, well, seven and 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 ten inch. You know, the old shellac ten inch shirt singles from from the fifties, really, and the early sixties. Uh, yeah, I used to play them all the time, but it kind of ended. I don't know. And maybe people kind of get to a certain age and they think music's not for me anymore and they watch TV instead or, you know, they, they concentrate on their careers or something. But it kind of ended about kind of early 60s. So there was loads of, you know, Bob Blumen and the Everly Brothers and Bill Haley and the Comets. And then it was just the beginning of the Beatles. So, so there was kind of the early Beatles singles they had there. And uh, and then it ended, really. So, <laughs> But, yeah, I used to... You know, play all those. I used to pretend I was a DJ and stuff. So that was uh, on that. Oh, event. really? Did you do the links and did you? I did all yeah. the links, yeah. yeah. There's, there's, there's cassettes of me somewhere with complete radio shows. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'd love to hear Can that. Can you remember the, yeah, we would. Can you remember the first uh, first records you bought yourself, first sort of singles you bought? Well, I was thinking this the other day, actually, because uh, I think, unfortunately, I'm, I, I guess a few people say this, the first single that was bought for me was Rolf Harris, Two Little Boys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for so many people. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that on, on some other uh, podcasts that you've done, and uh, it's kind of that embarrassing era now, isn't it? Where we, we, you know, we don't talk about Gary Glitter anymore. Or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Sarr. Well, you, it's, it seems only yesterday that Rolf Harris was, I think, was it at the, at the, at the, uh, the Royal the Birthday and Glastonbury? Glastonbury, yeah. yes. He yeah. was. So, you know, he, he was everywhere and suddenly, absolutely <laughs> not discussed. No, 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 it's nowhere. I know. Uh, so the, uh, yeah. it's, to be fair, Two Little Boys, great song and immensely sad. Very sad, yeah. Very I mean, really sad. heartbreaking. I know I was, I was I was probably like seven or something. And I do remember kind of crying. One yeah. Of, one of the uh, two records that I cried to, really. From the, the other one was, uh, you know, Gene, Gene Pitney, 24 Hours. It's only 24 hours to Tulsa. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. A very sad one, because I remember my uh, grandmother explaining the lyric and saying, he's not going to go back to his wife because he's he's met this other lady <laughs> and he was only 24 hours from home. And, and that's like, what? He's not going back to his wife? You know, <laughs> that broke my heart at the time. Oh. I like the idea of your grandmother explaining that to you. It's fantastic service, yeah. that is. Well, yeah, that's what happened. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but the first one I actually physically went out and bought myself with my own money was uh, You Sexy Thing by Hot Chocolate. Oh, yeah, was, yeah. I love that record. That was. Uh, Have you got any old sleeves there you've dug out? Or? You know what, though? You're going to really hate this, but uh, yeah. I, got, <laughs> I got rid of all my vinyl. Oh, don't oh, worry. Oh, God. Yeah. Have you regretted it or not? Not really, to be honest with you, because uh, like you sat, sat with a wall. And yeah, that's it. It. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, I, I didn't have quite as many as that, but I had loads of LPs and seven, <coughs> seven inches. And I went to live in, in the United States of America for, for a couple of years on two separate occasions. And each time I was kind of boxing all these vinyls up putting them in storage, yeah. getting them out of storage, putting them back on the shelves in alphabetical, you know, alphabetical order or chronological order or whatever, then putting them back in the boxes, putting them back in the storage. And it, I'm just like, why am I doing this? I'm not even playing these records. I'm just spending, like, days of my life boxing them up. And So I've got, you know, Sister Ray records in, in London. I got in touch with them and said, do you want to come down and buy a lot of records? And he came down. I did save a few that I, I, that I specifically had the emotional contact uh, contact with because uh go on what you got so basically when i was so like yeah so i guess after that kind of 
sixties, you know, I used to Radio One a lot. I was a big fan of Radio One. I remember in, in the early seventies, and then it was the kind of uh, which programs would that have been then? Who, or who are you listening to on Radio One? Yeah, Tony Blackburn, seven till nine. Jimmy Young, nine till eleven. David Travis, eleven yeah. till four. Johnny Walker, one till three. Alan Freeman, three till five. Oh, God. <laughs> wow, the whole yeah. day. <laughs> have you got a Radio One jacket? Surely, <laughs> <laughs> that level of knowledge is extraordinary. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you did the yeah, entire I've schedule. Been, I've always been obsessed with, uh, with with music and radio and pop culture. Generally. Let's I mean, just run through your Radio 1, you know, your schedule that you just ran through. Okay. And let's recall each of those programmes had a kind of gimmick, didn't it? Start with who was the first one? Tony Blackburn was Blackburn, first. Arnold Tony Blackburn had the, <laughs> had, uh, had the dog. Arnold the dog. Arnold. He pressed a button and the dog barked. Exactly. And, uh, and then he went and then it merged with Radio 2 for Jimmy Young. Is I think you said Jimmy Young next. Right, yeah. And that was, what's sure. the recipe today, Jim? He always had the recipe of the day. <laughs> had a little jingle there he had, didn't he? That was he did. Yeah. Then then did you say DLT? Is that what the one DLT, the, the snooker? Was it the snooker, snooker on, on the radio? radio? Well, that was I think it was. Radio. A mystifying, <laughs> mystifying invention. It was, it was a great idea. Oh, Lord. I think, oh. That, was, I think that was before he went to the, because he became the hairy cornflake and he went on. To the <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, then he was the hairy tea, fl- tea cake, yeah, wasn't it? Pre cornflake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then, of course, the next one was, was Johnny Walker, who was actually quite cool. You know, he wasn't really, it's a bit like John Peel, he wasn't in the mold of those. Uh, Smashing. I think his gimmick was he didn't have a gimmick. He didn't have a gimmick. I think he was very cool, as you no, say. No, John, you... Johnny's gimmick is the same gimmick he has now, which is he's really into the music, you know. Yeah. Because that's what people said about him in 1970. And that's what people still, still say about him now. And I work, I very occasionally work with Johnny. And Johnny, like all kind of long serving DJs, he's been known to whinge about things occasionally, you know, management or whatever. And I, I, I often I have said to him on more than one occasion, Johnny, when did you start this job? And he'll go, 1968 or whatever. 67, that's right. Are you still doing it, Johnny? Yes, I appear to be. Well, quit complaining. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there aren't many people who can say that. You know what I mean? It's amazing, really. He Sorry. also brilliantly trades on the fact that he was on a pirate ship. I yeah, think he still kind of trades as being pirate <laughs> jolly to this day. To a whole lot of people who are completely <laughs> mystified no by what idea. Earth he's talking, what they he's know, talking they about. They know the boat that rocked. Oh, That's right. Know, that, that's, that's all about it. About exactly. So Johnny was the next program. And what came after Johnny what, on your schedule? Oh. Alan Freeman, I think. Alan was, yeah. Freeman in Fluff. the afternoons. Wow. Fluff, yeah. I mean, what a, you know, has a, has a, has a probably playing the odd track by Camel. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, uh, yeah, because because he later on he did that that uh, the rock show, didn't he? Where Saturday uh, afternoon. Yeah. We used to put a punk in there as well, so he wasn't all kind of heavy rock. I remember hearing that show, and then every now and again it'd be, whoa, what's this? It's you know, it's the Sex Pistols or. Yes. <laughs> but he, uh, uh, I thought he was great. Oh well, sorry. Carry on. Yeah, well, we you're about to show us something before well, I. I say my favourite band when I was a kid was Mud. Oh, good. oh yeah, there's a lovely little uh, bit in your your graphic novel version of your um, of your memoir. Oh, where, yeah. I was reading this, but I'm going to show the picture. Where is this? Actually, I found it. It's you, it's and really the caption good. says, "We used to mime to Mud and Sweet Records in the school gym when it was raining outside." Oh, fantastic. can you see that? Hang on a moment. Let me just hold that up. Where are we? Well, we can't really see it very well, but we get the idea. Anyway, you get the idea. You get the idea. Well, there you go. I mean, I had the singles at the time, but uh, as I say, I got rid of them all, but I did have the greatest hits, so there you go. Yeah, I've got that. Mm. The did you do the dance? <laughs> of course he can do the dance. Of course you could. Could oh, you still do it now? Probably, yeah. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> I haven't got the space here, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I once so, saw yeah. Mud play a show in the West End of London at an awards do on a circuit on a revolving stage, probably past the first flush of their success. But anyway, they were introduced, ladies and gentlemen, Mud, and they struck up Tiger Feet or whatever and started revolving round into view. Only it stuck halfway. 
Oh. And only two members of Mud were visible. The other two were invisible. They were off stage until somebody managed to it's physically. Completely out of spinal tap, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> it's it's a, a, that's it's extraordinary. Tap. Mechanical <laughs> breakdown. <laughs> How fantastic. So, anyway. was, was glam a big thing? I guess it would have been. It was, yeah. yeah. Very I was, exciting. I was, I was kind of 14 and it was uh, all those bands. You know. It was thrilling. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. I loved, you know, I thought they were great. And. Uh, obviously T-Rex and all that stuff. So, yeah, but, you know, Mud were my favourite like, pop group. Uh, and then I I kind of had a few friends at school who were said, uh, you know, have you heard of you know, these other bands that are not in the charts? Which I'm, I'm, well, I say not in the charts. This was the first LP that I bought, really, because that Mud one I, I bought kind of retrospectively. Copy Rebel, the Psycho Mode. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, I mean, I suppose they were in the charts because they had that, that massive number one single, Come Up and See Me. But that was, that was later, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, Come Up and See Me was after that, wasn't it? I, I think it was. About 72. Oh, that's 70 the second, that, that's the second album, isn't it? It that, is, yeah. 1974, this one. Yeah. Right. But yeah, I played this to death. This was, this was my favourite record at the time. I remember there's a song on here, though, that... Uh, I can't remember the, the, which one it is though, but I was I was playing it on on the record player, and it it does feature the word masturbation. <laughs> and, uh, I remember my mum coming in from the kitchen. <laughs> she didn't say just as, just as it just as it played. Um, no, well, no. <laughs> so I was in the living room playing it quite loud, so, so, so she could obviously hear it, and she's oh. hearing the lyrics, and then she's she must have clocked this particular word, so she came in, and I was just sat on the sofa thinking, oh, what's going to happen? And then, and she just kind of picks up the record sleeve and, and kind of looks at the lyric and, and confirmed that it was masturbation. <laughs> masturbation getting off, I think it says. And then kind of walked out of the room again. I know that. I, it was like, right, so this wasn't a springboard for any kind of conversation then? No, no of course not. No. You're no. expecting. <laughs> no, you know. Uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Nobody's talking about it. No, no. And, like, and shock, really. I, I yeah. Shock that, you know, on a pop record, that her son of Bor that they, they were singing about masturbation. So that was a scary moment in my life. And I remember it very well. <laughs> I'm going to say, I, I'm yeah, sure it's very effective parenting. You still remember it. All yeah. Those years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. But then uh, I kind of started getting into more kind of progressive rock. And I say the Psychomodo was the, was played a lot, but this was the one I played. Today. Uh, Genesis oh yeah. Five. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what year was this? 19, 1973, but I, I kind of bought it later. But it's so... I saw them at exactly that period with, with him wearing exactly... Gabriel wearing exactly that... Uh, that what is, is it? The, is it the Foxy's head? I can't see from here. Is it? No, like, yeah. a, like an abstract kind of... Oh, it's the abstract. That's right, yeah. Amazing. But there's loads of, you know, there's the, the bat wing head. And <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, God. The shave bit at the front. Yeah. And that was a budget record, Phil wasn't it? Yeah, Phil Collins looking very suave and young. And ah, yeah, he yeah. was. Well, he was young. Well, he, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess they were, they were kind of in their 20s at this point. But. Well, he was always, you know, he was the boy, wasn't he, really, Phil Collins in, in Genesis. He was younger than the rest of them, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Mark, I think he, I think was, he yeah. was. Born in 1951, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, I don't know this. I don't so, know this. So that was a budget record, wasn't it? That it was, was, yeah. It was yeah. live, obviously, and... Uh, but I played this to death. I thought it was amazing. Yeah. It's only got, because it's progressive rock, it's only got five songs on it. There you go. But two <laughs> or one time. <laughs> That's what you wanted. <laughs> That's what, you probably went through the racks in record shops looking for the things with the fewest tracks. Where do you go and buy records? Can you remember? W. H. Smith in, oh, uh, right. okay. in the Arndale Centre. In, uh, in the <laughs> oh, right. They're very hip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you feel a slightly smug thing about prog? I can remember feeling a little yeah. bit pleased with myself that, that I was listening to stuff that was in a kind of 5-8 time signature or 7-8 or whatever. And, and then it had a kind of 15-minute solo from someone who was classically trained. And that somehow <laughs> made me feel rather aloof. It's awful, really. But... And it's like a little group you get, don't you, at school? Yeah. Where, you know, most people listening to us are still listening to Radio 1. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> to, uh, to, to yes and, uh, you know, Genesis and stuff, and uh, I used to look like that at that time. So there you go. Oh, very oh, good. Oh yeah, lovely. It's brilliant. Players and platforms. How yeah. did you? Do you used to advertise your musical loyalties by putting the names of of acts on? I don't know, in your school bag or anything like that. Do you remember doing anything of that kind? No, I didn't do that. I see. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. 
Sorry, that's a bit of a nice. No, it's okay. no, no. It's a cul de sac. Fred, Dave, and I did. We used to write down, you know, chicken shack or whatever in Barrow. <laughs> well, it was yeah. a cool bag. And dates us. <laughs> oh, wonderful. wonderful. Can you remember the first gig you ever went to? I can actually, because I uh, I used to, you know, when you used to collect, you know, tickets from, from concerts and so, and people, you know, I've got these amazing collections. Again, I didn't, I started off saving them and then I, I didn't save them anymore. But what I did, I, I compiled this list. All right, very good. There you go. Oh, wow. Oh, oh you're going to have to read. Band some of this. scene, that... that's fantastic. Go on, so Rick Waitman, read them out. Yeah. Pages and pages of it. So, did you write little notes about what? Was there a little review there as well? No, it's, it's just got the it's just got the the date, the year, the the artist, the the venue, and the support band. So the first to answer to your question looks like May 1976. Rick Wakeman at the Free Trade Hall in Manchester. So that was sport, the first gig. Sport band were. Do you know the name of the sport band on that? Not written on here. Oh right, okay. So I, I don't know. Maybe I got there too late to see them. But, <laughs> I used to love Rick Wakeman, actually, all those uh, concepts albums about Genesis, Sense of the Earth, and, you know, uh, Henry VIII. And... <laughs> oh, he was wonderful. I saw him in 70, 72, 71, I think, with the silver cape. Oh, yeah. It was terrific. And they did... Uh, silver cape covered in mirrors. It was mirror. nice as well, wasn't it, at one point? Yeah. Yeah, Which yeah he did a thing at Empire Pool Wembley. Oh, sure he did. Was, as it was known then. It was incredible. He was a huge star, wasn't he? Massive yeah. as a as a as a solo act. It's a rare, rare case of somebody leaving a big group and kind of yeah. justifying it, really. Because I did that because I obviously had the wedding present for years, and then I wanted to do a little uh, a little solo project called Cinerama, and everybody was saying, you know, solo records never do as well as the band, and I was like, no, no, this doesn't be great because it's you know it's it's like the wedding present, but it's going to be, you know, it's got more elements to it, and it's in a way more commercial because it's going to, it's not got that harsher sound. And of course it didn't. It, it didn't. Yeah. I was like, why? 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 Well, so it's just kind of recognition of, of a name, isn't it? it, it, was, it, this is, it is. We, we talk about this so often that in the end, do you not feel, I mean, you've had a long career in the music business and continues, you know, but your brand name in the end is the most important thing, isn't it? I suppose so. And of course, as an artist, you know, when we started doing Cinerama in, in whenever it was, 1997, it was on cooking vinyl. And they said, you know, we'll put a big sticker on the front saying, featuring David Gedge, from the wedding present. I'm like, no, no. I don't. That sounds awful. <laughs> and really kind of over-commercialise it. And of course, I was totally wrong. <laughs> I should have done that, you know, because that... I would have probably, you know, loads of people would have heard of Cinerama who didn't hear of Cinerama because they were flicking through going Cinerama and never heard of them. Who's next? Oh, the wedding present's got, you know, this re release. I'll, I'll buy that instead. So, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Brand name is very, very important. It's, it's hugely important. I mean, you in your case, I'm not getting try, seeking to get into your kind of uh, into your personal details, but do you own the name The Wedding Present? I don't think anybody could have, can own the name The Wedding Present, can they? Because it's... It, I don't know. It, oh, right. It's generic. It's, you know, it's a thing. It's like a table, isn't it? Or a, you know. Okay. Okay. I, well, I'm no, you sure. must be able to own it. It's an yeah, a, a, of a band. They must be, surely. Well, no, you can't own titles, I don't think. I think you can have the copyright of, of lyrics and music, but, but I think titles are not the copyright. Oh, right. So maybe that applies to band. But then you get those issues, don't you, when a, a band has to be called, you know, the London beat because it's already yeah, a wedding yeah, present. Yeah, 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 yeah. David yeah. Gedge's wedding present. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Like Slade. That's right. Bebop Deluxe. Go on. Yes. Um, Bill Nelson. So that was nine, nine, Yeah. I think that's many in 1977, but then you can see this change here because then it's XTC, Tom Robinson Band. Uh, and then I went to university and I saw a load. So, so by then, of course, it was punk, really. And. Uh, it was suddenly, you know, not, I was hiding all my, uh, in the same way I was hiding the pop records when the progressive, right. and, I, and now I was hiding the progressive rock records. Yes. Because I was going to see, who we got here. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so, when the punk arrives. Yeah. yeah. Wire, Ramones, the only ones. Like, look at that. You can tell, you know, I went to university, suddenly there's loads, loads of bands, Penetration, 
Wishbone Ash, so I still had a little... Oh, bit. you still I went to, to the Ash. The embarrassment of my Did name. you tell anybody you'd done that or just sneak in in disguise? I mean, <laughs> you know, my roommate, and I was like, yeah, you're going to come see Wishbone Ash? He went, no. <laughs> I was like, Argus, it's a classic record. You know, even if you like punk, it, it, you've got to admit it. And he said, no, no, I'm not interested. And, of course, I went there, and it's a completely different crowd. It was all the long-haired people still, yeah. like, beautiful coats and stuff, and... All my mates were totally not into that. So that was, you know, Vibrators, Clash, Devo, we went to see, Magazine. Here. Devo were fantastic. Yeah. Did they have a little, the little zip-up boiler suits? And, uh, yeah, yeah, it was a... It was are a, we not men slogans? It was like a theatrical... It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other yeah. yeah. than a pop group. So. so where did you go to university? Leeds. Oh, right, okay. I went back to Leeds. So, right. Um, but apparently it was a good university for mathematics, which is what I did. But the main reason was I I used to remember you know a lot of the bands kind of played there. It was, it, Is it? it? Like, you know, there was the Who live at Leeds, and I used to open the Enemy and uh, and and just see you know loads of bands as you just saw there you know from the list really. But, but it, it was definitely on the circuit, and I, and I just felt like it would be a good place to. Uh, yeah. So when you know. did you when did you first perform yourself? Well, I've kind of been you know it's a weird question now because. I mean, I suppose, you know, the wedding present started in 1985, but for years before that, I've been in various rubbish groups, you know, with, with skill, skill friends. I mean, you know, Mark's got that, that comic there where I was... Oh, yeah, you're in a group, was it called The Knot or something? Who were they, the, the, the school band? What were they called? Well, there, uh, there was the Mitosis and there was The Truth and, uh, yeah, kind of a few terrible... Yeah. But, uh, but, you know... I was performing there at that school disco. That was about 1972. I yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I've always, you know, been been doing it in, in one in one in one way or another. Uh, but, so John uh, Peel, who appears in, in, in the book too, was a major supporter, wasn't he? He was. Yeah, I love that quote. He said that the boy Gedge, he said, has, has written some of the best love songs of the rock and roll era. Hmm. He said, uh, I said, you may dispute that, but I'm right and you're wrong. Very Hepworth kind of way of arguing. <laughs> that must have made a, surely it must have made a difference because that was quite early on, wasn't it? It made a difference to, to, to me. Certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard him say that. No, it was quite late, actually. But I think it was after a few, I think it was probably even maybe in the Cinerama, but I heard him say it on the radio and straight you, away. Thought, you actually heard him say that live. Yeah, because I used to... Oh, incredible. What, what, what was that? How did that feel? Well, yes. Funny, the minute I heard that, I thought, wow, that, you know, that's going to go on my flipping epitaph. That is, that, that's it's John yeah. saying that so, I've written some of the best songs of the... the so the, is this... Uh, sorry, let's go back to this. Is this late at night you hear this on the radio? I can't, I can't remember exactly because... Well, so it, was I, usually, it was usually on late at night, wasn't it? It was on between 10 and 12, usually. 10 and 12. But, but Surely you didn't sleep after that. Well, to be honest with you, I probably taped it because I used to tape all the time. Oh, right, okay. And then listen the next day. And oh, right. all, all but what a heart attack. Did you then spend <laughs> about a week on the telephone ringing people up and saying? Well, I did. The first thing I did was I said, you know, can you, know, can you put it in writing? Because <laughs> uh, I thought, uh, yeah, I want it in writing. Actually, I've got the facts somewhere. So basically, uh, I can't remember if I emailed or called, you know, his producer at the time and said, you know, John's just said this about me on, on the radio. Is there any way that, that you could, you know, write that down because I think it would be really good. <laughs> and so and, and then and obviously it was the days of faxes and he sent me a fax and it it, it had that you know his him, him saying those words signed John Peel and uh it was a I, I know why it's because we were doing an advert actually for uh it was a radio advert for Cinerama for XFM and all those you know uh, stations like that and I I said Oh, yeah, you know, as part of the text, you could say this thing that John Peel said about me. And the people who were making the advert said, well, we can't do that unless we've got proof. Oh, but, of yeah. course, yeah, yeah. But that's why I, I, you know, I asked him for, for proof and he sent the facts. So I've still got that fax on there. That would be a good thing to show you. But going, for, going further back, can you remember, as Ben so often, musicians so often can remember, can you remember the first time you heard yourself on the radio? Oh, oh absolutely, right. yes. <laughs> Go on. Where were you when, tell us about it. Well, it was 1985, and uh, yeah, we'd just done this single, which is uh, Go Out and Get Em, Boy. And uh, we had absolutely no money. So I basically, I went down to, you know, to save the, you know, we had 500 press, I think. And, and to save the delivery charges, I went down on the National Express coach myself to the press front 
got them in two cases, brought them home back to Leeds. Where was the pressing Fantastic. plant? I want to know every day. That's just brilliant. Where was the pressing plant? You went on a National Express coach. Go on. It's somewhere near London, because it is making record. I, I can't remember the actual address. This is this is 35 years ago, Mark. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and how many copies were you picking up? Five hundred. Five hundred. Two yeah, suit, two cases. I had to borrow my mum's suitcases actually because I didn't. Oh, no, that's brilliant. Cases. Bit too massive, big blue suitcases. <laughs> that's it was fantastic. Day, it was before the days when they were on wheels as well, actually. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Five hundred six. That's got away a bit. <laughs> it was. It was heavy. That's incredible. And we got the sleeves press that printed at a local printer, but. But but they came in, you know, to, again to save money. We actually cut them out ourselves and glued them. Oh, what print. by hand? Yeah, all five hundred of them. Oh, what fantastic! And I, I'm pleased to say it, it's weathered quite well, really. It, probably it's better than well. if they'd been manufactured by a major company. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen I, them on eBay? And I wonder how much they go for. That must that's collectible, surely, isn't it? Yeah, I think they go up and down. It, it depends on how how fashionable I am at any time. Yeah, yeah. And that was all done. Uh, a letter set, of course. It's a bit wonky because we had to, you know. Oh, so, so we, tell us about hearing it on the radio. Who anyway, yeah. It? So we, I had a bit of a relationship with Peel uh, before that because I'll tell you the story, actually, because we, uh, I went to school uh, with a Do you remember the band called The Chameleons? All right, yeah. Yeah. So that was my friend Dave Fielding. Right. As he's coming around to my house to play guitar there. And... Uh, and we used to be in bands together, you know, when we were teenagers. And then I went off to university and they basically formed the Chameleons. And that's one of their singles, uh, as high as you can go. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but the reason why they became successful is because they went down to, to Radio 1 and hung around outside until Peel came out and gave them a demo tape, uh -huh. which he then played. And, and then he invited them to do a session. So... So they did a Peel session and then they eventually got signed to CBS Records and, and made records and stuff. So here's me thinking, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> here's, yeah. you know, I'm off to university and I'm, I'm doing this boring kind of mathematics degree. Meanwhile, my mates have just I made a demo tape, went down to Peel, and uh, you know, straight away they've got a Peel session and, and fame and fortune. So, so I started doing that. You know, we had, I was in a couple of bands before the wedding present. One of them was, was called The Lost Pandas. And, uh, yeah, we used to do, I think we did about half a dozen uh, demo tapes and we, and we went down and kind of hung, out, hung around outside Radio 1. So it gave people... It, it is amazing in retrospect that that worked, that, that you could actually launch a career by simply well, putting... it didn't. That's, that's my point. It worked no, you, you didn't, but it, oh, no, for other people it did. No, carry on with your story, but it's amazing got, it did. A postcard there from Peel. Oh. oh. Which one, and he, he says... Uh, I just blah blah blah. You, I know you think I stand between you and a, a degree of, of success, notoriety, or whatever. But uh, as do as do, it's it's right. It's terrible to be honest. Okay, that's all crammed together. Yeah. As do thousands of other bands, some of which get some of whom get quite aggressive in their criticism. I can understand your frustration. So there he's saying kind of you know I know you sent all these demo tapes, but basically not very good. And I know you hate me for it, but but you're not getting a appeal session. Right. So we kind of gave up. How sweet of him to write and say that. It was. Really yeah. sweet. Yeah. Uh, but then we did the single, and so we sent him a copy of that. And, uh, and he, yeah, I think when he played it for the first time, he, he said something along the lines of, this is, there's a lad you know, that I know up in Leeds called David, and he's, you know, he's, he's been a fan of the programme for years and he sent me the demo tapes, none of which I thought they were very good, to be honest, but uh, he's finally gone out and done this seven single and it's a pleasure to play on the radio. So, so he played that, you know, I go out and get him by that night and uh, and that I did hear live, actually, because I remember kind of running out. The, and the and didn't know he was going to play it, presumably, so that was a surprise. Well, yeah, kind of, you know, we you know, sent him one and listened for the next, you know, month just in case he would yeah. play it. Uh, and kind of dreaming that he would. And then, you know, I remember running out of the house down to the, because the bass player at the time, Keith, just lived kind of around the corner, hammering on his door. Have you got the radio on? Yeah, of course I've got the radio on. Have you heard? Yeah, he's playing the record. And he's like, yes, John, John Beale has played my radio. And, and of course, that's how it started, really. And the thing is, he played it about 10 times. 
And, and suddenly our lives changed because before that we were this struggling band trying to get gigs, you know, can you put us on in your pub? No, sorry, have you got a demo? So, no, yeah, I don't, I don't like it. Or, you know, you're just struggling to get attention, really. Then suddenly Appeal plays a record and people were coming to us, you know, oh, yeah. I've got this indie club in, in Carlisle. Do you want to come and, you know, do a gig? Or, you know, I'd be interviewed by my fanzine. You know, the enemy uh, came and we did an enemy piece just you know on that one single basically so right. yeah yeah you know, our lives changed kind of overnight really have you been on the cover of the enemy yeah a few times like i've got the first time have you I... got some let's see what's the first uh, oh that's great it was so, red nose day obviously <laughs> yeah 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 that's great right. so when was that we got what was the date of that? that was february 1988 so this was after George Best. So the first album was George Best. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That lad right there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Who was a major obsession of yours, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. George Best and Man U, in fact. Yeah, I grew up in, in, in Manchester and, uh, and uh, Man United were my team. And obviously he was the kind of star in the 60s and 70s. He was, he was the, you know, not only he was a great footballer, but he, he had that kind of, you know, the long hair and the, mm. the shirt outside of his shorts and... You know, he used to miss uh, practices because he'd, he'd been out dating Miss World last night or hanging out with the Beatles. And, you know, for a kid, I, I thought that was, this is amazing. You know, he's a, he's a brilliant footballer and he's a rock star as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. Completely. So I always thought, you know, I kind of wanted to pay some kind of tribute. And I just thought George Best was, you know, was a great name for an album. And then we saw this picture, actually. Uh, we went to a, a photo uh, agency, a sports photo, and, and I saw the picture. And I just thought, yeah, that, you know, that's the sleeve there. Yeah, right. I mean, obviously, that's not the sleeve. That's the sleeve was the photo. Yeah. yeah. These were cutouts that uh, that we did for, for, for record shops. They they stand up on the counter there, so they're probably quite flexible, actually. That's yes. Nice. Yeah, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, I, I, I remember someone. I think it was James Brown at the Enemy saying, "You know, you just want to associate the name of your band with George Best, don't you?" And I was like. Yeah, I, I do. I think I don't I want to associate the name of the wedding present with George Best. So, uh, yeah, that, that's George Best. I don't. I can't remember what the question was now. Did you get any? Did you get any legal um, kind of problems over that? No, because because we met him actually. We right. Uh, oh right. Again, I don't think you know, the only problem with you know, naming and it's a title of an album, and as I said, I don't think you can copyright that. But uh, I mean, there's always that worry. You know, is that you know, the right thing to do. But then our press officer at the time, Mick Houghton, I don't know if yeah, you know, know, we know Mick Houghton well, yeah. yeah. Very well. And he suggested, you know, we do like a photo session with him. What was it like? What, 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 roughly when was this then? So that'd be 1987. When, and, and how did that go? How was he? Well, I was, you know, he was great. I was, I was totally beside myself because it was, you know, I went, I'm in a room with George Best. You know? Yeah. <laughs> how surreal can my life be? You know? And uh, I didn't really speak to him. You know, because I, 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 you know, I was too much in awe and it was just too weird, really. But uh, he was very nice. He was very chatty to our guitarist, Peter. They were talking about fishing, I think, because I think they were both <laughs> insufficient. So I, I actually made the, the biggest faux pas because our manager at the time uh, brought in a crate of beer, a lager, thinking that, you know, it would smooth the the, you know, the social anxiety. Oh, dear. <laughs> that was the time. Where, so I said, yeah, George, do you, know, do you want a can of beer? And he was like, no, no, I'm, I'm not. Because obviously he was an alcoholic and he was he had his ups and downs throughout his life with alcohol. So, that, you know. But he was very oh, funny about it. I can remember him coming I back know. from America and saying that he'd seen a, a po big bill billboard poster saying, drink Canada dry. He said, so I did. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was really witty. Sorry, I'm carry just, on. I'm just embarrassed because you know, obviously, I knew that. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then here's me offering him a drink. So, just felt a bit embarrassed. And after that, I just shut up really and just let him let him, <laughs> let him talk. And uh, yeah, so that was that was a, a highlight of my life. <laughs> so, so it came out in America, still called George Best. No, the reason I was asking, Prefab Sprout called their album Steve, Steve McQueen, McQueen, but mm -hmm. I had to change it for America, didn't they? Oh, did they? Yes, it's called Two Wheels Good in America, isn't it? I think it is. Uh, yes, you're right. That's right. And I think the I don't know if Stephen Queen was still alive at that point, or or whether it was his his heirs, his estate that people right. were worried about litigation and whatever. But obviously, football is quite interesting because George Best is obviously absolutely massive, iconic footballer. But in those days, 
even iconic footballers were relatively easy to get to compared to nowadays. You know what I mean? If you yeah. if you wanted to put out an album called Cristiano Ronaldo, Ronaldo yeah. nowadays, <laughs> I imagine you'd uh, you'd be hearing Months from a learned of friends, you know, yeah. very quickly. Whereas with George Best, I think he got paid five hundred quid. Oh, so there you go. You have to turn up to this photo session with these you know, bunch of lads from Leeds who he, he, had, he had no clue who we were, obviously. But they, you know, I remember some people actually thinking that. It was an LP by George Best called yes. called the wedding present because uh, that can't be a bad thing commercially. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A few disappointed uh, punters there. Yeah. Not in America though. Yeah, uh, you mentioned America. Americans like who is this guy? What soccer? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. Be it's starting to happen though. I was reading today that uh, Premier League has just done a new deal to be uh, broadcast in the United States. Quite a big deal. So you know, finally. <laughs> Final. It's a big hill to climb there, though, isn't it? It's up against the NFL and. No, no, no I'm sure, but at least it's yeah. There's, I yeah. suppose, it's taking advantage of the fact that there's more and more TV outlets, therefore the streaming and all these kind of things. Yeah. It, yeah. It could, Are you could still be... a big supporter of of, of the Man U? I am. Yeah. yeah. Good for you. Just never, never. Where, stops where, being fascinating. Where do you stand oh. on the current on yeah. on Oli Gunnar Solskjaer and uh, what, what do you think? Is he going to be there at the end of the season? I mean, it feels like he's not going to be there, but, you know, it, it, it's a strange situation because, you know, we, we get hammered by Liverpool, 5-0, everybody goes, oh, Ollie's got to go. And then, <laughs> you know, then we win 3 So like Win 3-0, exactly. Every time he, he does something where you think, oh, that's it, he's going to be gone. But that, that's, that's the, the way it is. Just, it's, it's the way it time, is. Time, it's just death or glory. It's like, you're here forever and we love you or you're fine. I can't believe you're still around, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's changed, doesn't it? Because I remember, you know, Alex Ferguson had, had years before, you know, there was any success at Manchester United, but then, but they stuck with him. Whereas now it's like, well, you've been here six months and, you know, we haven't won anything yet. So, but know. they were sl slowly improving, weren't they? And the, and the club could tell that he was doing things. I love that detail that he introduced them to, 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 to eating broccoli. And, uh, you know, at that point, they were sort of literally having pie and chips, weren't they? Stubbing out a cigarette, finishing their double diamond, and then going on the pitch. That's right. I know. Those are the days. I know. Fantastic. <laughs> so you're, you're about, you're, you're going on tour soon, aren't you? Is that right? Yes, it's the, uh, the 30th anniversary of uh, our third LP, Sea Monsters, which came out in 1991. And so we, uh, yeah, we're doing that. We're doing that, which is, uh, it's quite interesting, actually, because... Of all the records that we've made, that one, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it, it kind of holds together. You know, it's like a theme. It, it's almost like, uh, it, it works really well. It's almost like one piece of music. It sounds a bit progressive rock, it's actually, but it sounds like one piece of music in, in, in 10 kind of movements or something, you know. So it's quite good to, you know, I get really into performing that one. It's, uh, again, right. it's like being part of a, a theatre or something else. So is it, is it quite fun to revisit your uh, repertoire in that way by saying, you know, because this is the thing that for years nobody did, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's do that record in including, that order. Including me, you know. The first time we were approached was in 2007, which is the 20th anniversary of George Best, actually. And Sanctuary Records were going to uh, re-release it in some way. And they said, you know, have you, uh, you know, thought about the idea of actually you know, playing the album live <laughs> in clarity. And I was like, no, I haven't. Because that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like, no, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. artist, you know, you know uh, that band was 20 years ago. I've got the new lineup here now. I've got all these new songs. I'm thinking about the future. I don't want to go back and wallow in, yeah. in the that. And they were saying, well, okay, well, it's your, it's your funeral. And I came away from the meeting thinking that's definitely not going to happen. And then I spoke to the rest of the band and some friends and some fans and, Everybody said, oh, I'd love to see you play George Best. Well, Dave and I talked about this quite a bit because it's, it's it's like classical music, isn't it? If you go to a classical music concert, you know exactly what you're going to get. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and, and there's not there's going to be any surprises. And so if you're going to see someone perform on that album, you know yeah. exactly. And that, that's very attractive. Because otherwise, people could be coming to see you and thinking, well, I'd really like to hear so-and-so. They don't get it. And go away yeah. a bit disappointed. So you're you're guaranteed to get what you. And when the LP originally comes out, you don't play the whole thing. Obviously, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a new LP, so you play like uh, a few songs. To yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Up, uh, yeah. So and also with the wedding present, especially we're such a live band. You know, all the all the albums are kind of us playing live anyway, really, just in the studio. So it kind of works as a set. You know, it's got yeah. a beginning and an end, and it flows and everything. And uh, so we so so anyway to finish the story, I, I kind of reluctantly. 
you know, went along with it. And then I thought, I thought, actually, I quite like this. It's, yes. it's, yeah. I mean, A, it's kind of going back to, you know, a diary that you've kind of written 20 years ago and think, oh, God, yeah, I remember this. And I, I remember feeling that way about this person or whatever. So that was interesting. And then also, it's a completely different band now. So, so they're kind of got a different take on, on the, you know, the, and we kind of reanalyze it in a way and reinterpret it and maybe change some things around a little bit because, we, you know, we feel like we can prove it and stuff. So, it, yeah, it's kind of a, almost like a living thing, you know. It's uh, So, yeah, so so I kind of reconciled myself to the idea that, you know, occasionally going back and playing an album is actually yeah. you know, as valid as, as, as playing new stuff. And it's only half the set. You know, we play for 90 minutes, so you can do sea monsters and then you still got over half Right, so you do it. You yeah. do it first, and then, yeah, and then, first, and then yeah. greatest yeah. hits. That's how Craftwork did their. They did their entire uh, catalog that way, didn't they? Different album each night, and then just a load of hits at the end. It's a brilliant album. idea. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of lyrics to to remember, isn't it? God, it is. Sparks yeah. as well, didn't they? I remember. They thinking, did how, amazingly. How did they yeah. How did, did, they, they, use, how did you... they use prompters? I mean, I just don't know. How, do you, how do, do you get on with remembering lyrics? We've been talking well, about this. Well, I don't anymore because. Uh, a few years ago, because uh, 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 I got my own festival in, in Brighton. I don't know if you're aware. Uh, uh, it's a thing called At the Edge of the Sea, which we do every year. And I kind of bring in artists that I've, that I've worked with and support the support bands we've had and stuff, people I like, basically. And we had Emma, Emma Pollock from the Delgados came down and she was playing the set. And she had a little iPad attached to a microphone stand. Huh. And I thought... That's it. That's, that's it. Because that, that's the. Because yeah. so can people not see that? Probably, they probably can't. Can they? They can see it. I think. Yeah. It doesn't matter anyway. I mean, I'm just astonished that people can. Rest. So many people use sort of prompters now, don't they? Oh, yeah, definitely. You would. And like you say, you if you go to a classical concert, people are reading scores. So, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, the violinist is not learning that part. Yeah, you know, are they? They're, 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 <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Like, you know, I've written. 300 songs or something it's you know, ridiculous there's no way i'm going to remember the lyrics and and so yeah i've got this little ipad now which i've just i mean i have it there as a prompt i used to do it on the floor sometimes i used to have like pages of certain songs and just key words but of course the first waft of dry ice <laughs> oh my god i can't see the flipping thing. <laughs> oh you know someone will grab it make them up <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Give it back. I need that. I can't sing the song. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the iPad is a bit more of a, of a solution to that, really. And uh, I find, though, once, you know, like if it's a two-week tour, you know, by the third or fourth gig, I'm I'm not really using it anymore because it's. Yeah. It, I think I've got the confidence. I think it gives you the confidence that if, you know, there's no panic that you can't remember the words, you know, it's all over. The, the, you know, the panic is I can't remember the words. Oh, they're there. Okay, great. And then yeah, yeah. I suppose it's just a it, it's um it's bound to happen, isn't it? When you've written that many songs, yeah. You know, whereas you see people in the first kind of five years of their career, they've got a relatively small repertoire, haven't they? Really? Yeah, exactly. It, it, I think a lot of bands that are our age kind of do concentrate on on kind of you know greatest hit sets, but we've never really done that. I mean, I think if you if you could get it down to like I don't know, 20 songs that, that, that you're always going to play. Sure, you could probably you know, remember those quite easily, but uh, we're always changing the set. You know, we're always bringing obscure B-sides in or, you know, right. you know, I quite enjoy that. You know, I quite enjoy challenging the audience. In, in yeah. some folks. And, uh, but also people will come see you more than once, won't they? Because, exactly, uh, exactly, because yeah. you know, you could, you could go the next night and see something completely different. I mean, so have you got any more there that you haven't showed us? Any other, uh, any other odds and ends and sleeves? Uh, I don't think so. No. I mean, no. Okay. All one, right. one, one thing That's I, fine. <laughs> one one thing I will show you is that I, when I was at university, I was a you know obviously like like most people. Well, not like most people. I used to I used to buy the Enemy, Melody Maker, Sounds, Record Mirror, and read them all religiously. You know, I used to spend days reading these papers, <laughs> and they used to cut out little pictures. And I had this massive poster on my wall, which was. Uh, kind of like uh you know so basically photographs of the uh, you know cut from the music papers and then when i left that flat i'd take it down and i thought ah what a shame you know it's going to destroy it so i actually saved it in this scrapbook this terrible scrapbook look at that my scrapbook I don't know where <laughs> oh god <laughs> where's that from 50 pence anyway that was oh, lovely. yeah but uh so yeah so i had all these 
Oh, I'm going to show you that. It's just basically, this is my poster in book oh, form. Right. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> we'll, we'll stick it together there. Blokes with guitars. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you see my identifying. Is that the fall? I just saw that. I can't yeah, I'm sure the fall are in there. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> it's a nice little snapshot, I suppose. Yeah, it really is. No, it's good that you kept it. Yeah. Who were the writers you followed in the papers, in the music press? Uh, who, are the, who are the ones you. Dave McCluck. Do you remember Dave McCluck? Yeah, yeah it sounds. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Dave Henderson and then. Uh, James Brown, I used to like it. You know, I thought he was a bit of a troublemaker, which was which was quite cool. Yeah, <laughs> Julie Birchall, I think was was kind of shocking, wasn't she? That you know, that was always good fun, even though. You know, oh, Julie was, Birchall. <laughs> yeah, yes. she was. But it, 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 every now and again, people remind her that uh, she and Tony Parsons' favourite group at one stage was the Tom Robinson Band. They thought we were going <laughs> to change the world. <laughs> yeah. No disrespect to Tom Robinson; he's fantastic, and they were a very good group. But they were they weren't quite uh, that stellar, really. Yeah. But anyway, but look, we normally end with the greatest record ever made, don't we? Yes. So, yeah. so have you got a suggestion for a nomination? There yeah. is no wrong answer, you know, single, yeah. album, whatever. Oh, what's he got? I can't see that. that. The Pixies, Surfer Rosa. Oh, oh right. right. Oh, yes. Okay. okay. Yes. We haven't had that one before. No, we haven't. Well, uh, that was the, the one that they recorded with Steve Albini. Yeah. Uh, I'll, yeah, I was familiar with the Pixies, but and I was I was familiar with Steve Albini as well because he was in a band called Big Black, who I, uh, I saw a few times. But then I thought I thought that album was the kind of meeting of two amazing talents, really, because the Pixies were great; they had great songs, you know, great band. But then, but the sound of that record is is so amazing because it's it's like a pop record, you know, you know, rock pop or whatever, and it's got it's got pop songs but then it, it, it just sounds weird it, you know, it just takes you know there's a surprising little diversions into into some otherworldly area uh you know and, it, and at that point we decided that, you know, we wanted to work with steve albini actually because because he wasn't a big name producer or engineer at that time but we decided to uh as, and we he actually recorded sea monsters which is the album yeah you're touring yeah yeah fantastic that was it. Word in your attic, a zoom with a view.